now that we've had pretty much most of the content in the class, we can go back, read the introduction, and understand what Russell and Overg are trying to say. I'll talk about what is artificial intelligence. I'll talk about uh, the history of AI briefly and uh, go through some examples in the state of the art. So what is artificial intelligence? I think that you can see from the history reviewed by Russell and Norvig that there's a discrepancy between two approaches or philosophies that motivate researchers in artificial intelligence. One is to understand how humans think. You can think of these as cognitive uh, scientists. And one way to understand how humans think is to try to reproduce their behaviors. So we can think about, on one side of our equation here, systems that think like humans and thus systems that act like humans. And the other side of this uh, divide is to produce systems that may not model human behaviors as such, but produce what we think of as being idealized in intelligent behaviors, rational behaviors, um, super logical systems. You can think of them as sort of the Mr. Spock of, uh, of AI systems. And uh, so their researchers try to produce systems that think rationally and thus systems that act rationally. Let's start out by looking at those who are interested in having computers act like a human. And this starts with the Turing test. So this is the same famous Alan Turing who gave us the Turing machine. And in 1950, he wrote a, uh, an important paper entitled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And we looked at that uh, at, a, at a discussion of that paper uh, very early on in the class, one of the first things we did. He reformulated the question of can machines think to say, well, what, what does it mean to think? We can't even uh, uh, understand how people think, but we understand how people think by looking at how they behave. So he reformulated the question, can machines think, as can machines behave intelligently? And he developed an operational test for intelligent behavior, which he called the imitation game. Now, I'm going to give a uh, very simplified version of Turing's argument here. And in the readings we had early in the class, you can see why uh, Turing's argument is, is more sophisticated. But the idea is that uh, our uh, human uh, judge uh, sits before a terminal, and it's, he's connected, he or she is connected to either a human being in another terminal or an AI system, and our human converses with the mystery system, and then tries to judge whether or not the... the um, uh, person or thing on the agent on the other side is a human or an AI system. Now, Turing predicted that by the year 2000, a machine might have a 30% chance of fooling a lay person for five minutes. Um, in fact, uh, to my knowledge, no, uh, uh, they, they actually run a, an annual Turing test, and to my knowledge, um, up to the moment, uh, no system has ever uh, uh, been judged to be human by uh, a human judge, although, uh, funnily enough, some of the humans were judged to be AI systems. Turing uh, was a deep thinker, and he anticipated pretty much all the major arguments against AI in the following 50 years, and he also suggested the major components of artificial intelligence. Knowledge, reasoning, language understanding, and learning. And as we've seen in the course, uh, these are the kinds of things that people uh, doing AI uh, research and development uh, need to uh, have in order to have intelligent systems. Now, I mentioned cognitive science a minute ago, and one of the uh, major threads in artificial intelligence has been cognitive modeling. And uh, this uh, approach includes uh, the famous work of Newell and Simon, which is discussed in the text. In the 1960s, 
there was a cognitive revolution in psychology, um, uh, which uh, uh, information processing replaced behaviorism, uh, the, the psychology of B.F. Skinner. And so this more sophisticated theory, uh, which went beyond reflex, and we've seen in the course the limitations of reflex agents, required scientific theories of the internal activities of the brain. But these theories um, weren't self-evident. What level of abstraction should they be? Knowledge, like thoughts or concepts, or at the level of circuits? Do we model brains uh, and minds at the neuron level or at the idea level? And also another problem is how to validate. So we could either have a model and use it to predict and test behaviors of human subjects, uh, which would be top-down, or we could uh, put electrodes in and do brain scans and so forth and uh, do a bottom-up approach where we got direct identification of these processes from neurological data. Um, so both of these approaches, the first one, the top-down one, uh, roughly is cognitive science, and the second one is cognitive neuroscience, are now distinct from AI. Um, there's, they have whole research communities that work on it, although at the edges, especially between cognitive science and AI, uh, the, the, the borders are a little fuzzy. But the idea is that um, both cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience share with AI the following characteristics. And that is this big problem that the available theories do not explain or lead to anything resembling human-level general intelligence. And thus, all fields share one principal direction, which is try to try to develop something like a general theory uh, that can predict human intelligence or model human intelligence. Let's turn from the cognitive side to uh, where we try to get computers to model humans uh, to the rational side where we try to get uh, uh, computers to behave uh, as ideally rational as possible. And here, um, instead of describing uh, human behavior, uh, we're prescribing uh, behaviors that, that uh, artificial intelligence systems ought to follow. And this school of thought goes back many thousands of years uh, beginning at least with Aristotle, and in fact before Aristotle, uh, in which uh, philosophers uh, looked at what constitutes proper logic in an argument. And uh, in fact, uh, several uh, schools of Greek philosophy developed various forms of logic, including notation and rules of derivation for thoughts. So, um, uh, for instance, uh, why do we call the rules which we looked at earlier in the class modus ponens and modus tollens? Because these are the forms of syllogism that come down to us from the classical world. Of course, these philosophers probably didn't get to the idea of mechanization of these processes, but because they're fundamentally symbolic, they lend themselves to symbol-manipulating machines, in other words, computers. So, there really is a direct line through mathematics and philosophy to modern artificial intelligence. There are some problems with the rational approach, and one is that not all intelligent behavior is mediated by logical deliberation. We do lots of things uh, that require intelligence, uh, reading, speaking, and so forth, where uh, it's unlikely that people go through classical logical reasoning to do that. Um, if I ask you to, for instance, um, tell me, uh, for instance, the average person's reaction to seeing the White House, um, you're, that, not, that person is probably not having some kind of logical process. Rather, they are going to express uh, a set of feelings that, about the government and the presidency and American history and freedom and so forth. And the other problem is, what's the purpose of thinking? Um, and uh, 
is it goal directed or is it more organic? Um, we can think of this as being what thoughts should I have out of all the thoughts, logical or otherwise, that I could have. And we know from our work on search that uh, the number of possible thoughts uh, is enormous. And uh, so uh, figuring out which thoughts to actually think, well, that's the problem, isn't it? So we can think of acting rationally uh, based on these thoughts as doing the right thing under the circumstances. So, uh, and we can define that for our systems, and we have defined that um, in, uh, uh, for instance, the Wumpus World or the Eight, uh, eight Puzzle as uh, doing something which is expected to maximize goal achievement given available information, like whether there's a breeze or what the state of the puzzle is. Some of this doesn't necessarily involve thinking. So, for instance, when you blink, when you sneeze, or close your eyes when you sneeze, something like that. Um, but, uh, but we know that thinking in this approach should be in the service of rational action. Aristotle thought that every art and every inquiry, and similarly every action or pursuit, is thought to aim at some good. In other words, uh, people have inherent goals, and their uh, actions are in service of those goals. We can see, based on what we've done in the class so far, that an agent, an artificial agent, has can have this goal-directed behavior like a human being. And we'll define an agent broadly as an entity that perceives and acts. So that's why our agents, uh, like the one in Wumpus World and like the ones we're building now, have sensors and actuators. And uh, as you've seen, our course has been des about designing rational agents, uh, those that behave uh, ideally uh, with uh, symbolic reasoning as opposed to modeling the actual cognitive behaviors of human beings. We can think of abstractly an agent as being a function from some history of these percepts to actions. In other words, it's not just the current percept that causes an action, but all the percepts we've had. So um, we, uh, our function goes from the history of percepts all the way uh, to uh, our action in the current state. And for any environment and task, our goal as researchers and developers in artificial intelligence is to find the agent or class of agents with the best performance. Now, as we've seen from the fact that the eight puzzle, even with the most efficient uh, uh, algorithm we could devise, uh, tended to outstrip the computational capabilities of our machines, um, computational limitations make perfect rationality unachievable. So what we're going to do is design the best program for given machine resources. So that's sort of an introduction to what we've been doing, a, a look back and a look forward. And now we'll look at the prehistory, history, and sort of state of the art of artificial intelligence. So as we mentioned uh, or discussed together in the last lecture uh, on video, um, AI comes out of philosophy dating back to the classical era, um, especially uh, logic, uh, ways of reasoning, um, and then later philosophy, including uh, uh, philosophers like Bertrand Russell, um, who saw the mind as a physical system. Um, and this provides uh, the foundations for understanding learning, uh, language. Remember that when we talked about speech acts, um, we uh, were talking about uh, the work of philosophers like Austin and Searle, and also um, work on rationality. Now, because our uh, systems, the ones we're building, uh, are based on computer programs, and especially computer programs uh, or computer languages designed around um, uh, uh, formal uh, logical reasoning, um, much of what we're doing in AI, uh, we can credit to 
work in mathematics on formal representation and proof. And in fact, every time you run a prolog program, effectively we're uh, doing a sort of automatic proof. And this relies, needless to say, on, on uh, uh, mathematical foundations in algorithms, computation, decidability, uh, what's tractable and not, and even probability, as we saw in our uh, little uh, brief foray into uncertainty in artificial intelligence. AI also comes out of uh, psychology, so uh, work on adaptation of agents or humans to phenomena, um, how uh, agents like human beings perceive and act, and especially experimental techniques to try to measure human thought and behaviors. Um, we also owe a debt uh, to economics, uh, which has a formal theory of rational decisions, a big debt to linguistics on knowledge representation and uh, grammar, and in fact, uh, the classes of uh, grammars that we know about in automata theory and, uh, uh, and so forth are due to linguists, uh, not to computer scientists. Neuroscience has contributed an immense amount, so when we think about things like neural networks um, and, uh, and uh, models of low-level cognition, um, then we're basically building on the, uh, the results of neuroscience. And then finally, control theory. Um, this is uh, work done primarily in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, where we, uh, where uh, engineers uh, built things like uh, autopilots and so forth. Looking at AI itself, um, the earliest work, real work, um, uh, would have been uh, work on Boolean circuit models of the brain. The idea was that each uh, neuron is a is a uh, uh, on-off switch, and they connect to each other. Um, the big breakthrough, which we talked about, was Alan Turing's Computing Machinery Intelligence, in which he describes the logical basis for intelligence and, 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 and describes his imitation game, which we call, now call the Turing test. Um, there was a, with the development of, of uh, computers uh, in the 40s and 50s, um, there was a flowering of early AI programs. Uh, Samuels wrote a program that played checkers. Newell and Simon uh, came up with Logic Theorist, which they, um, which uh, um, Russell and Norvig discuss at some length in the introduction, and uh, uh, Glertner's uh, Geometry Engine. Um, all very clever, and they had such, uh, they, they, they provided such promise for rapid acceleration. Um, and in 1956, there was the, the meeting at Dartmouth, and they actually adopted, introduced the term artificial intelligence. By the 60s, uh, computers were getting better, and uh, we got uh, Robinson's complete algorithm for logical reasoning. But uh, in the 60s uh, and into the early 70s, AI uh, researchers were discovering the problems of computational complexity. Um, it turns out that, uh, um, uh, that uh, these problems, as we have seen, uh, just have an immense number of branches and uh, it takes a great deal of reasoning, especially pruning of possible paths to get somewhere. And uh, at that point, uh, research on neural networks, which was started out with McCulloch and Pitts, um, had really almost completely disappeared, and everybody was doing symbolic AI. Well, the impasse caused by computational complexity led to the development of knowledge-based systems. So these are expert systems that, instead of trying to reproduce general intelligence and then have that general intelligence solve a problem, um, uh, these systems uh, uh, specialized in a particular area um, like uh, tutoring of something or providing uh, 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 expert uh, advice about, uh, say, um, uh, some specialized field of medicine. And, uh, um, and the, a lot of this work was quite sophisticated um, and also involved uh, developing um, more sophisticated models of control to uh, enable more sophisticated reasoning. And in fact, uh, in the 1980s, 
uh, expert systems uh, boomed as an industry. Um, even yours truly helped write a uh, major expert system shell, which was uh, commercialized uh, in Japan. But um, AI winter set in uh, 80 and 88 uh, through say 93. Um, uh, there was a uh, this this uh, uh, systems in, expert systems industry uh, faded because it turned out that we reached the limits of what we could do on a uh, uh, subdomain by subdomain basis and research in AI tended to fade. But while that was going on, uh, neural networks uh, were coming up from underneath and uh, people were even designing chips that had neural networks on them and so forth. The idea would be that uh, we would try to provide a general cognitive model uh, based on the underlying circuitry of the brain and it was going to learn automatically and reason automatically and so forth. Um, in the late 80s, uh, 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 there was a resurgence of uh, probability. So um, uh, systems were able to do a lot more because we had things like genetic algorithms, uh, other kinds of learning algorithms that uh, made uh, uh, rapid advances possible in a lot of fields, including, uh, for instance, uh, uh, machine translation. So whereas prior efforts at uh, 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 machine translation were entirely symbolic, you try to parse sentences and then translate them and so forth uh, using rules, um, machine learning based on very large data sets um, provi provided probabilistic interpretations um, of, uh, of, of language, and, and that turned out to be very successful. In 19, by 1995, uh, people were producing artificial agents, um, and in fact, uh, those actually go back sort of a prehistory of agents uh, to the late 80s. Um, so uh, my own dissertation from 1988 had the first example of artificial agents who could uh, talk to each other and exchange terms dynamically. And uh, my colleague David Traum, who got his PhD, I think, in 93, uh, also uh, worked on, on similar things. And finally, uh, by the mid-2000s, um, machines were getting powerful enough, learning was getting powerful enough that that we entertained the notion, finally, of getting human-level artificial intelligence uh, within the realm of possibility. So what is it that um, we can do? Well, um, one thing that uh, can, uh, uh, can a computer play a decent game of ping pong? Well, yes, it can. Um, can it drive safely along a curving mountain road? Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, it, uh, the sensors can see where the edges are and so forth. Um, can it drive, Can a car drive safely along Mesa Street? Uh, not so much. I mean, this is the goal of uh, the Google car, um, but, um, you know, with things like pedestrians and other cars, it, this is more problematic. So that one may not really quite be here yet. Um, can we buy a week's worth of groceries in the web? Yes, this is a really symbolic uh, AI thing. If we know what kinds of things we need, yeah, we can do that. What about buying a week's worth of groceries at Albertsons? Well, that's a lot tougher because we've got a physical system to work with. Um, it involves uh, perception issues, uh, motor issues, so that one uh, off the table at the moment. What about playing a de decent game of bridge? If we think about it, um, it's a symbolic AI problem. It involves probability. Yeah, that's something that computers can already do. How about discover and prove a new mathematical theorem? Well, again, it's symbolic. Um, and in fact, uh, um, that was done some 40 years ago now. Designing and executing a research program in molecular biology, also possible. Uh, writing an intentionally funny story. So there are there are um, uh, uh, programs that were written to write stories, um, and in fact, I even had a uh, uh, undergraduate thesis uh, written uh, here at UTEP by one of our students here uh, who was working on story writing. And you can write stories 
but especially the early story writers uh, weren't uh, couldn't produce an intentionally funny story because humor is really difficult to produce. Uh, they tended to write unintentionally funny stories, which they were sort of stories that kind of made sense, but to a real human being um, uh, were laughable. So that one's off the table at the moment. Um, what about giving competent legal advice in a specialized area of law? Yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing that a good expert system can do. Translate spoken English into spoken Swedish in real time. Yes, we have uh, uh, spoken real-time spoken language understanders that are okay, think Siri, and if you've got it in one language, well, you can translate it into another language. What about conversing successfully with another person for an hour? Well, as I, I think I gave the game away in the history part because I said that nobody, no system had yet passed the uh, Turing test with Turing's imitation game. That's something that computers can't do yet. Perform a complex surgical operation? Well, it's a limited domain. Um, it provide, it's very specialized, and that's something uh, computers can do right now. But what about unloading a dishwasher and put everything away? Well, that requires dealing with a large variety of possible circumstances, from different kinds of dishwashers to different layouts of kitchens to all kinds of stuff in the dishwasher. And so that's something that we can't do. Well, these uh, things in red, um, those represent the kind of, a kind of uh, delineation of the frontier of artificial intelligence. And some of these are pretty basic, like conversing with another person for an hour. Um, and, uh, and some of them are really practical, like being able to drive safely along a busy street. And uh, as you and your uh, classmates uh, uh, go into artificial intelligence, become research and developers, these are the areas that uh, you are going to have to contribute to in order for us to make progress.